welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Anybody? Anybody at all in this room interested in what God has to say today from the word of the Lord? Wow. Well, then stand to your feet and let's prepare our hearts to receive the word of God. I'll get down on my knees. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Now, Lord, we haven't come into this place to hear from a man. We haven't come into this place to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from an old man or a young man. We haven't come to hear from a tall man or short man or black man or white man or brown man. We haven't come to hear from any of that, Lord. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Father, as you bless us this day, we would ask that you also bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless them, Lord, as you would bless us this day. If they're hearing and listening and preaching the gospel, they're our brothers and our sisters, and we love them and ask you to bless them. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we ask you, Lord, to bless them as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all said amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and get your Bible. Go with me, if you will, to Hebrews 6 chapter. As we get into the word of the Lord today, some great things are going to come out about your life. The title of the message, if you're making notes, is Encouragement from God. God is in the encouraging business. He's in the two areas that he likes to do. In fact, you'll find that the teaching of the disciples as well as the teaching of Jesus Christ, they went about teaching and encouraging. The word they actually use is the word exhortation, exhort. And the word exhortation just simply means to encourage. And God is interested in teaching you, correcting you, and then encouraging you. And what we've just gone through is a time of correction. Remember, this was the hard time where you'll find that the writer was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, making a statement like you should be teachers and yet you're still in need of milk because you're babies. And he really gets on the people. Then right after he gets on the people, here comes the encouragement right afterwards. God really wants to encourage his people because it's very important that they have something. God would never ask you to do something. God would never encourage you to be something. God would never ask you to go somewhere without providing you the ability to do it. So when God asks you to do something or God encourages you to be something, it's because God's given you the ability to do it. You just oftentimes don't know that yourself on the inside. And that's what really this is all about. And as we look at the word of the Lord, we find this as a, as, a, as a beginning, if you will, to the end of the chapter of great encouragement, a great time where God is encouraging his people. I find this to be true. There's a man out there that he's only going to go as far as he is encouraged. A man will only go as far as he is encouraged. But then I found over the years that there's some people you can encourage and they don't receive the encouragement. Maybe that's you. They can be encouraged and for a few moments they feel built up, but as soon as the reality of the world hits them in their face, all of a sudden they go back to being discouraged and frustrated about their life. A man will only go as far as he's encouraged as long as he receives the encouragement, and it's very important for us to see this. I want to take you, if I may, into Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Here's the beginning of the encouragement. Let me just read it. I'm actually not going to explain these verses. I'm just reading it as a point of understanding encouragement. But let's take a look at verse number 6 of the 6th chapter, excuse me, verse number 9 of the 6th chapter of Hebrews. It says, But beloved, we are confident 
of better things concerning you. Remember, he's just said you're babies. You need to be encouraged to go forward. You should be teachers at this time. Don't mess with God. This is a serious thing. You need to respect God. You need to understand this is serious. And then he comes along and he makes a statement. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. God is making a statement that God is confident of better things concerning you. Can you imagine that? Maybe better things than you think of yourself. God's got a better plan for your life than you have. So God is in this business of encouraging people. We think better of you. You never should go to a church unless a church thinks better of you than where you're at, taking you to new levels with things of God. Yes, things that accompany salvation. In other words, I'm thinking better of you about those things that literally accompany the very fact that you're connected with Jesus Christ. So we speak in this manner. Verse number 10 comes along. And I love verse number 10. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. I love the word how God equates it with unjust and forgetting. He equates them together. An unjust person forgets what goodness has been bestowed on them. Have you ever done anything good for people and you don't appreciate it? They didn't recognize it. They never patted you on the back. They never said anything. It was like you did something and nobody even cared. And you just want to quit. You just want to give up. God's making a statement that he loves you so much, cares so much about your future. He wants you to know that he, even though the people may have forgotten, listen to what it says, God is not an unjust God that he would forget. In other words, people may be unjust and be forgetting the goodness that you have displayed to them, but God will not, listen to these words, forget your goodness. That's good news. Your labor of love of which you have shown towards his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. God won't forget that. The rest of the people may, but God doesn't. You need to know that. Verse number 11 comes along and he says these words. And we desire that each of you show the same diligence and full assurance of hope until the end. In other words, here's the encouragement. You started, let's finish. You're full of hope at one time. You ought to be full of hope at the end also. You ought to keep on going, be strengthened, strong. God has greater things ahead of you. God believes the very best of you. There's great things ahead of you. Jesus said he's come to give you life and give it more abundantly. God has an abundant life waiting for you. You say, then if he has this one, why don't I have it? How come I don't operate in it? You're going to find out today. How come I really don't get the abundant? I know what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. God wants me to keep on keeping on. God wants me to be blessed in every area. I believe that. Then why aren't I blessed? That question will be answered today. Verse number 12. Let's take a look at verse number 12. But do not be sluggish. And then he says these words, but do not become sluggish. Did you know that you can become sluggish if you're looking at people to respond instead of God who wants to respond? The people will forget the good things that you do, but God will never forget because he's not an unjust God. So therefore, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't back down. Don't stay the same. Don't think nobody notices, but notice this and remember this, that God will not forget. He says, but be imitator of those who faith and patience, listen to this, inherit the promises. God's got promises ahead of you. God's got a future ahead of you. God's got a destiny ahead of you. There's a purpose why you, listen to me now, hold on. There's a purpose while you were on this planet. And God has a plan for your life. And he says, I want you to imitate those. I want you to see what other people have done. I want you to hear what they've done and see what they've done. They have inherited the promises. You can inherit the promises of God too for your future. And guess what? He comes along and he says, be imitators of them. Recognize them. See them. Adapt them. Build them in. God is a great and mighty God. He starts to encourage the people. Now, can I ask you this question? It's so funny for a lot of people. Listen to this. Why people don't receive encouragement? I mean, think about it. Why is it that people don't receive encouragement? Have you ever encouraged somebody and they look at you in a blank face, give you a little quirky smile, 
thank you, I know it'll be okay, and go right back into depression, go right back into discouragement, go right back into where they were before. They may have been encouraged on Sunday morning at church, but by Monday the reality and the pressures of the world hit them in the face and they stop right there and they're right back to where they were before. Let me tell you something, that's not good enough. God wants you to realize you can live every day and every hour being encouraged by God and you can receive the encouragement that God has for you. You don't have to go back and keep doing the same old depressed things over and over again. So why people don't receive encouragement is a very important question because for all of us that are in here, we might be one of those people that get encouragement but never really receive encouragement. And God wants to share that with you today. Why? So that you can learn. Why? So that you can apply. So you can see yourself as where you need to be. Why people don't. Let me just say this to you. In order for people to receive encouragement, they're going to have to change their thinking. Just like Marie up there, first thing she started as she came to the church, she had to change her thinking about who she was, where she was coming from, what she could accomplish, what she couldn't accomplish. Can I just say this? You can't accomplish anything. That's true. But in Christ Jesus, the Word of God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Bible says nothing, nothing, not something, nothing is impossible to him that believes. With that in mind, how in the world can you not accomplish what God has for you? You need to take the encouragement of God and use it every single day in your life. Somebody ought to say amen. But here's the deal. Have you ever known Christians that are blessed and known other Christians go to the same church and they're cursed, it seems like? They don't get anything. Some people are blessed, some people aren't. Have you ever wondered how that works? It's all about this word encouragement. Some people will receive the encouragement and believe it. Some people will hear the encouragement and never really believe it. And it's all about the attitude and conditions of our heart. And we've got to change the attitude and conditions of our heart. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear that as a man thinks in his heart, finish it, so is he. Let me say it again. As a man, here's what the Bible says. As a man thinks where? In his heart, so is where? He. That's what it says. In other words, not just thinking in your head, but what's on the real inside of you. What's deep down? How do you really see yourself? What do you really believe about yourself? What is it that you really think about what you can do, what you can't do? It's on the inside of your heart. Or do you just always see what others have told you? Well, have you always see what your parents may have said? You'll never go anywhere. You'll never be smarter. You'll never have a house. You'll never accomplish anything. You'll never do anything. You'll end up in jail. You'll end up here. You'll never be anything but a failure. You're not smart enough. And they put you down all. Will you let those things dictate the truth to you when the truth is really what God says, not what man says? And that's what truth is all about. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If he ever thought of himself as a loser, he'll never be a winner. If he sees himself as a failure, he'll never be successful. As he sees himself broke and down and just getting by, he will always be broke down just getting by. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And that's what this is really all about. And a lot of people can't receive insure, uh, encouragement from God because of the way they think in their life. Yeah. Let's talk about it just for a moment. I'm going to take you to a bizarre part of Scripture where Jesus himself is speaking. If you will, go with me to Mark in the seventh chapter. Two verses in Mark, the seventh chapter, that are really very fascinating. Mark, the seventh chapter. We're talking about we need to change our thinking because there are people, and could be even us, that do not receive encouragement. Mark, the seventh chapter. Let's read verse 14. And let's take it and understand it. Here's Jesus speaking. He's not just speaking to himself, nor is he speaking just to his disciples. He's speaking to a multitude of people that are following him. 
These are housewives. These are farmers. These are goat herders. These are people delivering milk. These are people that work in the fields. Common people just like you, just like me. And he makes a statement to them, a very important statement. How do I know it's important? Check it out for yourself. He says, and when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear me. Stop right there. There are people that listen and there are people that hear. And there's a difference between listening and hearing. When you gave an order to your teenage kid to clean their room and they didn't, you said, did you hear me? They were listening, but they didn't hear it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever talked to somebody? Have you ever talked to somebody? And you can tell by the expression on their face, they are listening, but they ain't getting it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on. Remember those relatives you have? You know what I'm talking about now. You talk, they listen, but they don't hear. And Jesus makes a statement, and he says these words. He says, hear me, everyone. In other words, this isn't just for somebody out there, just a few, but this is for everybody. You need to be attentive to what I'm saying. You need, and not only do you hear me, but he says, you got to understand what I'm saying. So when Jesus makes a statement, and before he makes the statement, he says, this is so important that you need to hear and you need to understand. Now, there's a, there's a bunch of you out there that are staring at me right now, and you're listening, but you're not in a position to hear and understand. Therefore, when Jesus says something that'll change your future, you aren't going to get it. Until you get to the place where what's being said is important and valuable so that I need to clearly understand it. Why? Because if I can't apply it in my life, it doesn't work. Are you following me? So some of you are daydreaming. Go ahead and keep daydreaming. Then you'll always wonder why some people get blessed and some people don't, even though you're both Christians. And this is the key to it right here. Verse number 15 comes along, bizarre statement. Remember, hear and understand. He says, there's nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him. That's the craziest statement I've ever heard. There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him. Some of you would say, wait a minute, you don't live with my husband. <laughs> Some of you might say, well, you don't know my wife. Some of you might say, you don't know my relatives. You don't know my mom. You don't know my dad. You don't know my parents that weren't there. You don't know what they said to me. You don't know what the school teacher said to me. You don't know how I felt embarrassed. You know what the peers of my life said to me that told me and tore me all apart. And here Jesus makes a statement. He says, nothing can defile you from the outside that comes into a man. Nothing, nothing. You say, why would he make a statement like that? We've all been defiled from the stuff that's on the outside of our life that's come in. There's always been problems that have come our way. There's always been trials and tribulations. There's always been people that have hurt our hearts that have defiled us. The word defile means to pollute. There's always stuff on the outside wanting to pollute my life. And yet Jesus makes a statement. There's nothing out there that can pollute you. He's not a liar. Obviously, he knows something we don't know. Statement comes up like this. He says, and it's a good one. There's nothing out there that can pollute you because there's a solution that I give you to the pollution that wants to come to you. And if you don't understand the solution to the pollution, then what happens is you receive the pollution and destroys your future. So Jesus comes along and says, there's nothing out there that come into you and pollute you. 
Because, here's another way of putting it scripturally, no weapon formed against you shall Well, then why am I brokenhearted? Why am I down? Why am I broke? Why am I discouraged? Because that which came into you, you didn't use the solution to get it off of you. I hope you got that. Because that all of us live in a world of pollution. It's all going to come in and try to defile us. Problems from the kids, problems from the finances, problems in the economic conditions, problems from the social conditions, problems from the Supreme Court, problems from the governor, problems from the president, problems from the world, problems from our society, problems from the stock market, problems from the river real estate market, all of them coming to pollute our lives. But guess what? If I have a solution that goes against that and keeps them out of my life, and I use that, then can I just say something to you? Then it can't pollute me. But if I take it in and speak it out of my mouth, because that's the way I see it, then the last part of the verse comes in. But the things which comes out of a man, these are the things that defile a man. In other words, if that which comes to me, I accept and have no solution for, then it's part of my life, and then all of a sudden I'm speaking out of my mouth. I can't do it. I'm a loser. I'm a failure. I'll never accomplish anything. What makes you think I have anything? I don't have an education. I'm not smart enough. I'm not cute enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not gifted enough. And all of a sudden, now you put yourself in a place where what comes out of your heart, you are now defiling, polluting your future. Most of you today live exactly where you're at because of what you spoke in your life in the past. Your parents said it. You believed it. They may not even have said it. They may have lived it before you. And now you live what they live. Let me ask you something. How many people do you know are taught since childhood to apply the solution that God gives us for the pollution that's in the world? Think about it. Listen to what I just said. Listen. How many people do you know I don't care if you come from a Christian family or not. How many people do you know that are taught from childhood to apply the solution to the pollution that wants to come against you? Nobody. Your grandfather's never taught you anything about Jesus. They never sat you down and said, here's how to be an overcomer, more than a conqueror. Here's how to realize that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. They never taught you the formula of how to be successful. There's no father, mother that you had. Maybe some of you had Christian parents, but that doesn't make you immune to the pollution because you know a lot of Christians that are full of pollution, down, depressed, discouraged, frustrated, don't even go to church anymore. Why is that? Lousy witnesses. Oh, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. Well, guess what? You're going to die, go to heaven, but while you live on earth, we'll never make this statement and you will never accomplish what God would have you to accomplish. Why is that? Because no one ever taught them from childhood how to combat by using the solution against the pollution. You say, well, Pastor Tim, what are you talking about? You and I come to church to learn the solution against life's pollution so that we can be all that God's called us to be so that the life doesn't restrict us but the power of God launches us. That's what this is all about. We are products of what we spoke in the past and what we've been taught In the past, you may be a Christian headed for heaven. But are you living that Christian victorious life that God paid for? My Bible says that God 
is the God that gives you the power to get wealth. Wealth, not just money in your pocket, but everything in life. A prosperous man isn't just a guy with money. It's a prosperous man. It's a guy with a family, a children, finance, dream, all headed for God, all serving God. That's a prosperous man. Not only leaves the destiny of Jesus, but lives a financial inheritance afterwards. That's what it's all through the Old Testament. Solomon got everything he got from David. That's a prosperous man because David was hooked up with God. But David didn't just say, well, I'm hooked up with God. I'll sit around and do nothing. He went out and did something, made commerce work. Because his God was bigger than his own thinking about who he was. How did he learn that? He learned that through the trials of Saul chasing him. And you and I have got to get our thinking changed to what God sees us and what our abilities are, not based on what your physical ability is, is based on your physical ability with God backing it and God empowering it. That, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's the difference between this message and some foolish psycho-cybernetic uh, new age guru, goofball, positive thinking message. This is not a positive thinking message, man. This is a positive word of God. God message that backs who you are. That's the difference. In other words, we stay in our pollution because all the stuff on the inside that came from the outside, we didn't know how to combat it. We didn't know how to resist it. We let it in and now we speak from our mouth everything that that pollution says we are yeah. instead of what God says we are. Is anybody listening? I think Jesus, when he made this statement to the multitude, and it's preserved for thousands of years so you and I can look in to a destiny that we have set before us, is making a pretty powerful statement. And it's a weird statement, but it's a true statement. And you got to get this. Now watch this. I want to share this with you. I'm going to take you from this thought, and I'm going to support it with another verse. Let me give you 1 Corinthians, if you will, the 10th chapter, verse 13. Just pop it up on the overhead. First part. Now let's read it together because I want you to see this. Now listen to what we're talking about. We're talking about why people don't receive encouragement. The reason they don't receive encouragement is because, hey, they don't know how the solution is to their pollution. It says, no temptation has overtaken you. See the word temptation in your Bible, circle it, put the word trial, tribulation, problems, pressure. Or guess what? The pollution of the world. Write that down. Those are temptations that want to come in, pollute your marriage, ruin your kids, take everything, steal your life, steal your finances, ruin your pleasure, keep you from all the joy of the Lord. We come into the house of God, we say, this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. And I look across the audience and 90% of the people are sour pusses. Why is that? Because they don't know how to realize that the word temptation is a pollution from the outside that wants to rob your joy. And where your joy is robbed, you'll also lose your strength. So he says, no temptation is overtaking you except that which is common to man. Wait a minute, you mean the problems that I have or what? Common to man, everybody's gone through them. And then right in the middle of the sentence, God is faithful. Where did that come from? In other words, the problems you have, but here's the answer, here's the solution, God is faithful. Okay, that's great. Then why doesn't he come through? Ah, because you haven't applied the solution to the pollution. Listen to this, watch this. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able. In other words, the pressure that's on you, you can handle it. You say, wait a minute, I'm ready to lose my mind. I want to die. I want to kill myself. What are you talking about? I can't handle it. It's because you're not applying the right solution to the problem. So God makes this statement to make us us aware that the problem is coming and if you use the right solution to the pollution that wants to destroy and defeat your life, guess what? Then there's nothing that's going to keep you from the things of God. And you can make it through. Verse, last part of the verse says this. But with the problems, trial, tribulation, temptations, the pollution of life will also make an easy way of escape 
will make a way, listen to this, of escape, will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Can I ask you a question? What's the way of escape? I want to get out of the problem. I want to get out of the depression. I want to get out of the frustration. I want to get out of the little me and take me to the where God wants me to be. I want to get out of myself and get into him, but I can't seem to break loose. And here he says, I'll give you a way of escape. Will somebody please teach me the way of escape? Your grandpa never did. Your mother and father never taught you. The last church you were in never taught you. For most of you, they just blew smoke all over you. I mean, we are so stuck in stupidity, it's amazing. Can I talk to you just for a moment? You have no idea all the coins we take out of the fountain. People are making wishes and throw money in our fountain out there. We're gonna pay off the building from stupidity of man. You'd think you'd get past all of that. Hello, this is about the word of God. This is not about some superstitious walk by a fountain, throw money in. Grow up. And that's what Jesus says. See, because that's not the solution to your problem. Does anybody listen? You still like me at all, man. I'm, I, I'm, really, I'm, really, I'm really like in your face, you know what I mean? I mean, you can go to another church, they'll treat you really sweet. But you're never going to learn the escape. See? And I don't know about you, I need the escape. Make a way for me to escape. What for? That I might be able to bear it. Here's the escape. I'm going to take you back, not only a hundred other verses I could take you to, but I'm going to take you back to verses we were just in so that you understand them clear. Hebrews 5th chapter, starting in verse 13. Remember, he's scolding these people because they should have been people that were teachers instead of people who needed to be taught. Remember that? In the end of the 5th chapter, Hebrews in other words, they were people who threw their coins in a fountain waiting for God to have give them something instead of took, taking the right solution to the pollution that comes in their life. Is anybody listening? And the key to this is found in whether or not you are mature or immature. In the mature, you'll find that there's an escape. In the immature, you're going to keep throwing your coins in the fountain and hope God hears you and answers your prayer. Don't you think you want to get past that? So here it is. Let me give it to you. Verse 13 says this. Talking about them being babies. So everyone who protects a milk is unskilled. I should have highlighted the word unskilled. The word unskilled is, in other words, they do not know how to use something. They're, it's like giving them a hammer and they're hitting themselves in the head with it. God gives us the word of God and we do not know how to use it. We much rather throw a coin in the fountain out in the courtyard and make a wish and think that is the solution to the pollution that's coming in and defeating you at every round. When in fact the solution to the pollution is found in growing up and becoming skilled, not in what I say, not in some goofy mental thing, not in some false cultish ritual. Listen to what the Bible says. It says become skilled in the word of righteousness. Because when you're unskilled, you're a babe. But when you're skilled, man, the Bible refers to it in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, as a sword of the spirit. Cutting away, two-edged sword. In other words, the pollution comes. The solution is you take your two-edged sword, which is the word of God, and you cut it away. Because it's eternal. It's eternal. It's more powerful than anything. Everything you see on this earth is going to dissipate and be gone. But the word of God is eternal. Jesus spoke and the planets exist. And when you repeat... What Jesus said, you change the molecules of the world you live in. (laughs) 
So in order for me to become mature, I become skilled in the word of righteousness. Wait a minute. Let's go on the next verse. Remember, we're talking about we're talking about solution to the pollution. We're talking about a way of escape. Here it is. Watch this. For self who belongs to those who are full age, mature. That is those who by reason have their senses exercised to discern what is good and evil. In other words, your senses become so sensitive, you know what is God, what isn't God. And then what isn't God, the pollution that wants to come in, listen to this, you use the solution, which is the word of God, against it. When I'm not feeling good, here it is, God. I'm healed by the stripes of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I may not feel good, but your word says, and it's the eternal word of God. And I'm telling you, Lord, I'm healed by the stripes of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When I'm not mentally doing well. And let me tell you something. We all, at times, are not mentally doing well. Lord, you have given me the mind of Christ. You haven't given me the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Lord, when I, when I don't know how I'm going to make it, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Lord, I don't see how this is going to work. All things are possible to him that believes. I just took the sword of the Spirit, and I'm just cutting away the problem. And guess what happens, man? The problem has got to leave. Got to leave. Now, listen to me. I didn't say it's going to leave instantly. It says, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee. You got to resist him. How long? Who cares? You win. So the solution to the pollution of our stinking thinking that we speak out of our mouth that dictates our future is for us to become skilled in the righteous word of God. And we use that at every turn of the road. Marriage is failing. Thank you God that I love my wife as Christ loved the church. Feeling? I'd like to knock her out. <laughs> but the word of God <laughs> don't tell her I said that. She's not in here right now. No, I'd like to knock that woman out, God. It's a woman you gave me. Uh, you know, but here it is. Here's how it works. God, you've called me to love that woman. Like Christ loved the church. I'm now using something against my heart that instead of my heart receiving the pollution and defiling me from the outside, I'm now using from the inside speaking out of my mouth. By the way, in case you want more information about it, write it down. James 3rd chapter. Read it. It's all through the scripture. James 3rd chapter says your mouth and your tongue is a little member who catches on fire your entire future. Whew. What we speak is what we're going to live. How you see yourself is what you speak about yourself. So we have our senses exercised. I'm going to conclude with this word. I'm almost finished. You tell me what you think God wants for you. Jeremiah 29 Verse number 11 says these words. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Notice what it says. Says the Lord. Here's God saying, I know what I think about you. You don't know it is why he said it that way. Do you know this? God knows it. That's why he made that statement. I know the thoughts that I think about you. You don't know them, but I know them. And then he defines them. And he says, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And let me tell you something. You can either take in the pollution of this world and all the things your relatives say about you and your friends have said, all your stinking excesses that left you and called you names, and you can make that your mantra for the rest of your life, or you can say, no, I don't receive that. I use the word of God. I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the field and blessed coming, blessed going, that everything I put my hand to, I shall prosper. And that's using the word of God against the pollution that comes in. In other words, you use the solution to 
get free of this stuff. And now you no longer have that lousy thinking. You no longer have that thinking that says you can't make it. Now you've got thinking that says, oh my goodness, there's nothing that can hold me back. Now there's nothing. It's me and God and God and me and we can make this work. Your call. So the answer to the question is why people don't receive encouragement. It's because they're so caught up in their past and in their pollution of their life and they haven't replaced it yet with the word of righteousness. Are you going to replace your feelings and the pollution of your past with what God says or are you going to live in the pity party of your past? Because what you say today determines where you will live tomorrow. What you say today will determine what kind of future. I didn't say that. God said it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As it speaks, faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. So all of a sudden your faith gets strong as you speak the word of righteousness. Stop speaking cursings and defilement over your marriage. Stop speaking junk over your husband or wife. Stop speaking negative garbage over your kids. Stop speaking misery over your family, your children, your finances, your dreams, and even your own personal ability. Your ability can only go as far as a human can go. But how far can a human go when God is behind him? Somebody else ought to give me a great big amen. That's the difference right there, my friends. I am totally and completely out of time. I apologize for going so long. But I think you got something out of it. <laughs> Woo! You want to practice this week? Listen to the words that come out of people's mouths. Just don't say a word. Don't try to correct anybody. You ever been around? Oh, you should say that. Oh, just shut up and listen. <laughs> just listen and watch them hang themselves with their own words so it becomes a learning curve for you. Just watch what people say around you. I preached this last service. I was greeting people at the back door. How are you today? Good to see you. I'm not so good today. I said, God, man, did you get the CD? Because <laughs> some people listen, don't hear, and never understand. And until you hear it and understand it and apply it, the pollution from the outside will defile your inside until it comes out and you pollute yourself. Pollution doesn't come from the external experiences. Pollution comes from your mouth. That you let it out of your own mouth. You defile yourself, Jesus said. Your call. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Woo! Life changing. Let me just say this to you. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. The problem with it is I'm out of time, so I can't mess with you today. If you're not right with God, then anything I preach just today won't work for you. In order for you to get right with God, you're going to have to give God, hear me now, give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Bottom line, listen to me right now, all or nothing. You're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. Book of Revelation, Jesus says these words. I'm coming again, and don't you know he is? And he says, well, when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. You know what he just really said? He really said people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and are going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Wow, what a statement. Lukewarm, what's that? Little in, little out, little up, little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, of course he is. But he's not everything, he's just something. The truth be known, he'll never be something until you make him everything. 
And that's what born again is all about. It means you've given God all of your heart, given God. It's the only way to heaven. Getting, being a good guy, getting christened or baptized when you're a child, your parents telling you're a Christian, none of that will get you to heaven. You'll just die and go to hell. But somebody needs to tell you the way to get right with God is to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. So today, let's do that. You say, oh, how do I do that? You do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. I'm going to count to three in a moment. One, two, three. I'll go like this. And I'll pop my hands together and go, bang, when you hear that sound. Bang, your hand goes up, I'll see it. When your hand goes up, what you're saying is, I don't want Jesus in my head. Like, look at me now. I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up, and then you can put it right back down. Couldn't get any simpler than that. Giving God all of your heart and all of your life. Today is your day of salvation. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure. Today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. As you hear that bang, boom, you get your hand up all over this place. You say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. I can't raise my hand. I'll be too embarrassed. People I came with will see me. People behind me will see me. I mean, I'm, I'm admitting I'm not a Christian. Uh, it's embarrassing. Uh-huh, you might be embarrassed. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a few moments in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think and see instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that dumb. Back to the family room, I'm talking to you. Back to this family room, I'm talking to you. All across this auditorium, in the foyer, by television, even the internet, all over the world, live streaming. Right now, I'm talking to you. All across this place, today is your day of salvation. I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm counting to three. I'm going to pop my hands, lift your hand up, then get it right back down. That's simple. Let's get right with God. Today is your day of getting right with God and being born again. Ready? Here it is. One, two, Three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Nine, ten, seven, twelve. Thank you. Thirteen, fourteen. Thank you. Back here. Fifteen. Thank you. God bless you. On this side over here. On this side. I didn't see anybody in this whole entire section. Like, like right. Oh, there you go. Seven, eighteen. Thank you. Nineteen, twenty. Thank you. Back there on top. Thank you. There's twenty. Anybody else in the family rooms? Anybody else? There's twenty, twenty-one. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for twenty-one wise people. Okay, here's what we want to do. Real quick, because uh, getting out the driveway is a crowded experience, but it's a good experience. A church that you can get out of real easy, mm -mm. this one here is hard to get out of because it's a good place full of people. People are coming, people are going, and it's a good experience. So listen to this. Give me just a moment. All 20 or 21 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Get your stuff. I want you to get out of your seat. Bring somebody if you need to bring a friend. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. If you didn't raise your hand, you know, you're number 22, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever. I want you to get out of your seat. You can come too. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. No one leaves during this period of time because when you're going that way, it's discouraging for people to come this way. So let's all be respectful of the Holy Spirit who's drawn people. Let's stand and welcome all the people that raised their hand and anybody that should have raised their hand. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, you raise your hand, you're serious. Get up here. Come on, come on, come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Oh, they're still coming. Give them a hand as they come. Okay, 
Okay, well, thank God you guys have come. Real quick, everybody up here, look down here to your left. See this guy, his name is Pastor Joseph, really good guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. He's gonna pray with you, give you some free stuff, tell you about a program we have that'll help you get strong in Jesus. We want you to be mature. We don't want you to go, and we don't want you to be weak and a child. We want you to grow to maturity with the Lord. Let us help you to do that. Make a left turn, follow Pastor Joseph right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.